The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Je l'ai résumé au cardinal Ratzinger, en quelques mots, n'est-ce pas? Oui, même si vous nous accordez un évêque, même si vous nous accordez une certaine autonomie par, par rapport aux évêques, même si vous nous accordez toute la liturgie de 1962, pas, de 1962, si vous nous accordez enfin, les, de continuer les séminaires et la fraternité comme nous le faisons maintenant, nous ne pourrons pas collaborer. C'est impossible. Impossible. Parce que nous travaillons en direction diamétralement opposée. Vous, vous travaillez à la déchristianisation de la société, de la personne humaine et de, 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 de l'Église, et nous, nous travaillons à la christianisation. On ne peut pas s'entendre. Rome a perdu la foi, mes chers amis. Rome est dans l'apostasie. Ce n'est pas des paroles, ce pas des mots en l'air que je vous dise. C'est la vérité. Rome est dans l'apostasie. On ne peut plus avoir confiance dans ce monde-là. Il, il a quitté l'Église, on quitté l'Église, il quitte l'Église. C'est sûr, 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 sûr. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Snagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Tom. Good evening to you. Yeah, thank you. Good to see you again. You too. Father, tonight uh, we will return to the email inbox. We've got some great questions in here. And the first one, Father concerns the role of a spiritual director. So could you explain, Father, what does it mean in this day and age for someone to have a spiritual director? What is the role of a spiritual director? In this day and age? Mm -hmm. Or in this day and age traditionally yes, speaking. Yes, both. Why not both? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, spiritual directors are hard to come by in this day and age. Um, but traditionally the church would uh, advise people who wanted to make progress in the spiritual life to find a spiritual director, it would be a priest, who would get to know them very well, uh, who would be far more than a confessor. And people can go to confession, as they, they must, and receive the sacrament of penance, receive absolution, but the confessor might change, you know, the, the person might not necessarily go to the same confessor all the time. And also, uh, the confessor, even if he were their regular confessor, would not necessarily get to know them, because confession, uh, the act of confession is guarded with a certain anonymity. Um, even in closed circles where the priest might recognize the voice or certain characteristics, there would be the, usually the conf confessional screen, uh, which would, you know, obscure the identity of the person who was confessing. So the idea of the priest getting to know the individual very well, getting to know the, the person's character and uh, struggles and predominant fault and, and so on, would not ordinarily be possible simply by going to confession to someone. So... Um, when someone shows a priest to be the spiritual director, uh, he would be looking for someone who would be knowledgeable about the spiritual life and uh, have a certain degree of, um, well, at least in the eyes of the one choosing him, a certain degree of holiness or a love for God, you know. A person would choose someone who would have faith and hope and a genuine love for God. <clears throat> the wisdom and the prudence to direct the soul, but also um, be willing to speak as he would. I mean, these days, you know, you talk about a spiritual director getting to know the individual, his character, his faults and his failings and his struggles and so on. And uh, there are people who out there would say, well, you know, that's getting too close. But I mean, people do that with their therapists. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, instead of having confessors and... Uh, 
<clears throat> and uh, and spiritual directors now that they they've thrown that all over, you know, and now they go to their therapists and pay hundreds or thousands of dollars for therapists, you know, <clears throat> who have no more qualification than is the ink on a piece of paper, a certificate on the wall, you know, and uh, they reveal all these intimate details about themselves to their therapists, but that's perfectly okay, <clears throat> because it's all about things of the world. But when you're going to a therapist, you notice something. Um, I, I don't know this firsthand, I must admit. <clears throat> I cannot claim to have firsthand knowledge of going to a therapist. But I hear it from people who do have therapists, and that the focus is on them. It's all about them. The person who's undergoing therapy, uh, everything is focused on them. You know, all of their attention is about them. <clears throat> that is generally the source of all of their problems. <laughs> That's why they need a therapist, I mm -hmm. think, because everything sort of centers around them. It's all about them, what's going through their minds, you know. It's not quite the same as going to a spiritual director, because for a Catholic to go to a spiritual director, it's about our Lord, it's about Christ, it's about God. And it's about their relationship to God. <clears throat> and uh, how they can uh, be more uh, faithful to our Lord and, and, and love Him more. Uh, and um, so the, the ultimate reference is beyond the individual and uh, the ego um, to God. And um, so, whereas in spiritual direction, there is a great deal of talk about the individual, about their, what goes through their mind, what goes through, goes through their hearts, and so on. It really is the true therapy in the sense that it is tr uh, looking to kind of tune up the soul, as it were, <clears throat> to um, enable the soul to make progress, to help the individual overcome obstacles, standing in the way of their spiritual progress. So you might say that the therapist uh, has the role of a of a, a father, but also a coach uh, to to advise them how to how to deal with things in a better way, uh, a very practical way. I mean, what, what you're looking for in a spiritual director is someone who can actually take the principles of the spiritual life given to us by our Lord of the Gospel, given us through the Church and apply it in this individual life, in this individual soul. <clears throat> of course, this involves time. To get to know a soul that well and to be able to analyze what the problems are and what the solutions are, and, and to advise, to be a constant advisor and coach of the individual spiritually. It takes a good deal of time, and that's why it's difficult to find um, a good spiritual director in these days, because I'm, I'm talking about traditional Catholic priests here. Um, one would not go to a Novus Ordo priest for spiritual direction because <clears throat> they themselves need spiritual direction to get out of the Novus Ordo, the new order, and to return to the traditional faith, you know, practicing the traditional faith, the traditional religion. <clears throat> so the fact that there is the... Um, uh, you know, the, the need to find a good traditional priest with the faith, hope, and charity, and the wisdom and prudence to, to guide the soul, and who's able to give that time for the individual soul. That's, that's a difficult prospect these days. And, Father, with the crisis in the church uh, that's happening today, how does that affect the role of a spiritual director? They mentioned here how um, a spiritual director, if one were to have one today, a, tr a true traditional Catholic priest, uh, they would not have the uh, they would not have the jurisdiction of a diocese. Would that affect the spiritual director's role? Well, does not choose a spiritual director on the basis of having jurisdiction of a diocese. But regardless, I mean, to look for to look for the authorization from modernists is antithetical to the whole idea being <laughs> being traditional because. The modernist purpose is to is to eradicate the traditional, and they are. Uh, now I wouldn't say using; they're abusing authority or the pretense of authority or the pretext of authority, 
in order to crush any traditional uh, um, initiatives, right? Uh, they want you to accept the new mass. They want you to accept their new sacraments. They want you to accept their <coughs> just their, their new religion because it is modernism is their faith, which is anti-Catholicism, and the new order is their religion, and that's anti. Catholic. It's, it's, it's the con contrary of the Catholic religion. And so you would not um, go to a modernist for spiritual direction, nor would you, uh, you know, expect them or, or want them to authorize you to practice the traditional Catholic faith, which is the antithesis of modernism. I mean, you know, Tom, one could say what they want, you know, Father Jenkins doesn't know what he's talking about, who is he to say this? I'm just basing myself on what St. Pius X himself said in the encyclical Placenti de Medici Gregis in 1907. Uh, this is what he said. Go read the encyclical. He talks about modernism and what it is. It's the antithesis of, of Catholicism. Uh, and it is the modernists that have gotten into positions of control in the Church. They've kind of hijacked these institutions of the Church to foist <clears throat> the modernist anti-Catholic faith and anti-Catholic religion on the Catholic people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre said it very well. When he said the le coup de maître de Satan, Satan the, the, the master stroke of Satan was to use obedience against the faith. Right? Father, uh, they, uh, they also ask here, is there a difference between a spiritual director and a spiritual advisor? Well, I guess there could be. I guess it depends on how you advise them. Uh, I guess it depends, I'm sorry, on how you define them. Okay. But in the um, his tradition of the church, I don't know that there is any neat distinction between the two. I would think that they would be one and the same. If one wanted to make a distinction, I suppose one could say a spiritual director is someone you see regularly for, let's say, a continual counsel on how to live your Catholic faith more fully. <clears throat> And um, a spiritual advisor might be somebody you just go to on occasion when you are looking for specific answers to mm -hmm. specific problems, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah. Depends on who's using the term and what they're using them to express. Okay. And Father, as, as far as some, uh, some practical advice in this matter, we talked a little bit about this last week. And, you know, in this day and age when it's so hard to come by a traditional Catholic priest who can dedicate his time to you and, and be a, a, spiritual, a true spiritual director, um, it seems that perhaps there wouldn't be many better options than turning to a lot of the saints who have written so many uh, wonderful volumes on the, the spiritual life. And in particular, we talk about St. Francis de Sales, a, a giant in the, the spiritual life, and um, just all of the writings that he had concerning the spiritual life. And in particular, uh, we talked about the introduction to the devout life, which St. Francis wrote, and I think that is... Um, just an absolute, but it's a classic. It, it's, 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 a, it's a such a wonderful book it's a because it, it's uh, it's so basic. It, it's just mm -hmm. like like he says. It, it just lays out the basics of everything, and it's it, he goes into so much detail. Uh, you, you know, he he describes almost exactly what each and every day should look like. You know, he, he gives mm -hmm. he, he gives uh, so many particulars. For example, you know, you should he says that you should spend an hour a day in mental prayer. Your mental mm -hmm. prayer should be derived from meditation on our Lord's Passion. And he tells you the exact steps, gives you an exact formula of how to meditate. Right. Remember, um, though, he's writing for religious. Okay. You know? And so, um, <clears throat> Theophila, he, he's writing... Mm -hmm. To religious, he's writing to sisters, right? Mm. And that doesn't disqualify him or his writing for a spiritual direction. Um, you know, to, to, to read a spiritual book is not the same exactly as having a spiritual director there. Sure. To hear, you know, what's going through your particular mind, what's going through your particular life at that time. But I would say that the writings of St. Francis de Sales are so universal yeah. <laughs> in their application that in, in, uh, even if one had a very competent spiritual director, um, there's no substitute for the writings of St. Francis de Sales in a person's life. Sure. Uh, that's, th that is where everyone should go, I think, uh, as a sort of um, a touchstone, you might say, you know, to... Uh, to, to, to to get the spiritual life actually off the ground mm -hmm. for a person. So 
Um, I would advise that to anyone, whether they have a spiritual director or not, to read the, especially the, um, the writings of St. Francis de Sales, uh, the treatise on the love of God. <clears throat> uh, they would do well, actually, also to read the three ages of the spiritual life by Father Garrigo Lagrange, although some might find that a bit obscure. Uh, but it's still definitely worth reading, sure. no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. So there are some spiritual classics like that that can bring the soul a long way, even if they can't find a spiritual director. Definitely. Uh, as such, they can get a lot of spiritual direction from these writings. Okay. You know, another book that comes to mind, which is very practical, is that by the Barnabite priest, Father Quadrupani, uh, Light and Peace. Mm-hmm. He even talks about, briefly, he talks about the difference between a spiritual director and a confessor. And uh, he gives a lot of practical advice. And again, you know, it's not the same as having the, the other quadrupani in the room talking to him about your, you know, what you're going through that day and, <clears throat> you know, getting some uh, a coach's advice on how to deal with these partic- practical situations. Nonetheless, he's so down to earth and he deals with is- issues that are so common to the human soul that I think... Everyone who would read his book, Light and Peace, would come away with benefit. And, and actually, in writing, reading the book, you might say, uh, each one might say, he's talking to me. You know, this applies to me, today, here and now. So I highly recommend that. Sure. Uh, another book, again, uh, which is so uh, essential for spiritual development and uh, spiritual guidance in the world today, would be Dom Scopoli's uh, The Spiritual Combat. It's another very fine... Each one of these books has its own particular character, um, which means that you know each one of them has its own particular contribution to make in the spiritual life. And one would do well to read them all. <laughs> sure. That's great advice, Father. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thanks, all right, then, Father, let's move on to another email here. This is from a new reviewer who says he, he recently started watching our videos, particularly about the Nova Sordo. And he says, when I tried to talk to someone that attends the Nova Sordo and find what traditional Latin mass to go to, they replied that he should go to one that is approved by the Holy See through a diocese. As I found out that a traditional Latin Mass that follows the Holy See is still invalid, I now believe that the chair of St. Peter is vacant. Because the Knights of Columbus worship Francis, should I let them know I wish to resign or just walk away? I would also like to get involved with your group and understand not to attend any more Novus Ordo Masses, which is a grave sin. So any advice here, Father? Well, uh, he says the Knights of Columbus worship Francis. (laughs) Um, You know, back in the 1500s and 1600s, Catholics were accused of papalatry. Mm. They actually set popes up as almost idols, you know. Instead of the vicar of Christ, as though they were the, actually the replacement for Christ, you know. And um, that wasn't true. Catholics did not worship the Pope. That's a modernist development. This is what the modernists have done. They've actually proposed their Novus Ordo Popes, John the Twenty Third, Paul the Sixth. We'll skip John Paul the First. He was only there for one month, you know. John Paul the Second. They actually encourage almost a kind of hyperdulia, if not latria, like a worship of them, like an adoration of them, like almost as though they, they can do no wrong. I mean, they, they've already canonized or pretended to canonize a couple of them. They're going to canonize, they say, Paul VI here very soon. I mean, this rush to canonize them, it's, 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 and you, you hear people, by the way, talk about John Paul and now St. John Paul II, and they become almost breathless when they talk about him as though um, he's the greatest saint. I mean, I've actually heard people who said that. They thought that John Paul II was the greatest saint the church has ever had. This is how they exalt and extol their Novus Ordo Pontiffs. Well, what they're trying to do is cover up the nakedness of the Novus Ordo. And they're trying to canonize the Novus Ordo, is what they're trying to do. But uh, believe me, this is not uh, this is not Catholic. This mentality is not Catholic at all. Um, the Catholics never worshipped worshipped the Pope uh, from the time that Peter stood up and 
and challenged uh, from the I beg your pardon from the time that Saint Paul stood up in Rome and and challenged Saint Peter because of the scandal that he was causing. Remember that when he wouldn't eat with the Gentile converts. Um, right on through down through the centuries, Catholics and and um, I'm talking about on every level, right? Um, would stand up and they would they would talk. Um, truth to power, you know, with regard to the Supreme Pontiff, if they thought he was doing something that was not in accord with the gospel, uh, not in accord with his office, that he was somehow degrading his office of the papacy, and thus attacking Christ, they would make it very clear um, that he was failing somehow. And uh, only with the Novus Ordo now do we get this... this uh, <clears throat> Um, worship of Francis. So, so when he says, does, uh, you know, that the, the, the Knights of Columbus worship Francis? Well, it's possible that they do. How does one make an idol out of anything? Well, they put him in the place of God. And so how will the Antichrist put himself in the place of God? He will arrogate to himself the power to basically deny God and to contradict God. As if to say, well, Christ taught this, but I'm telling you this now. You know, the church has always taught this, but the church is wrong. I'm telling you now. Because I, I am, uh, as I say, I am um, vetoing what the church has said, or even what Christ has said, and I'm correcting mistakes that they made. Now, Francis essentially has said that recently, right? even with regard to the death penalty. The church was wrong all that time. I, Francis, know better now, right? And I'm going to set you straight, okay? And uh, this is what the Antichrist will do with Christ. He will revise Christ, right? Claim to have the authority to revise Christ and his teaching. Well, this is what these Novus Ordo Popes are doing. They're revising Christ. They're revising the church. They're revising the faith. They're revising the worship, right, with their Novus Ordo. Are they not, in fact, placing themselves up as idols to be worshipped in the place of Christ? I know it sounds like an outrageous thing to say, but in fact, when you, when you look at the new audience hall, as I mentioned in a recent video, and you see how it's constructed, and you see the occult... Uh, features of that audience hall and the placement of, let's say, Paul VI, who had that installed, but the horns, you know, that appear to be rising out of the head of him as he's sitting in the chair, and the, um, the so-called Christ risen from the nuclear blast with the serpent's skull, you know, coming out of the side of his head, and the serpent's eyes, right? I mean, how can you not see here that they're they're actually creating something that is really an idolatrous form of worship. So, I guess, really, maybe this gentleman is not exaggerating when he says that the Knights of Columbus worship Francis. I think this is the mentality of the Novus Ordo now. So, Father, how, how should he go about leaving this group? Should he make some kind of statement? I, 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 I think he should just... tell them that this is wrong, what they're doing is wrong, and may, make it very clear. But I don't think he should stand up in the midst of them and start giving a speech. <laughs> he won't even get a chance to explain it'll turn into an argument and no good comes from that if I were he I would sit down and I would start making a, a, uh, a drafting a letter to them maybe to all of the members of uh, the lodge and, uh, and uh, in a very thoughtful way um, he, he obviously has to pray before doing it, after doing it and while doing it, <laughs> right to the Holy Ghost uh, to help him to think clearly, express clearly what he's thinking, and to convey the truths of the faith to them and what concerns him. And he should just submit like a letter of, recommend, of, of resignation to them mm. from that. Okay. Uh, because he cannot be part of idolatry. And uh, he should find the, a true traditional Catholic chapel near him, if there is any. I don't know where he is, and maybe he doesn't say, but don't you try. shouldn't say anyway on, <laughs> on the air, I guess. But, I mean, if he wanted to uh, tell you, tell us where he is, we can try to direct him to a real traditional 
a real traditional Catholic chapel because there, there are a number of fake ones out there that people are taking advantage of the situation of the church to, sure. to uh, kind of mimic, right, or, or somehow disguise themselves or, um, uh, what should I say, pa pass themselves off as traditional, but they're not really traditional, not faithful to Catholic tradition. Sure. And, you know, he mentions also, I, I guess, um, um, the idea of like what they used to call the indult mass mm -hmm. or now the Samorum Pontificum mass or the Unicum mass or whatever they want to call it, uh, as though you're going to practice the traditional faith within the modernist structure of the Novus Ordo, mm -hmm. which is completely antithetical. I mean, even the Novus Ordo, people understand that. The Novus Ordo hierarchy even brand this, the attempt to practice the traditional faith within their Nova Sordo modernist structure, the extraordinary, extraordinary f form, right? So even they are saying, well, this is just kind of a fringe, right, for them. Um, it's, it's kind of strange in a way, because, you, you know, you get people who go to the diocese, Latin mass, <clears throat> And they, they say, oh, yes, well, I, I practice the traditional faith <clears throat> within the church. You, know, you don't, you know, as though there's something wrong with you. And they somehow have a, a superior position to you. But I think you have to point out to them, do you realize what you're doing? You're getting the worst of both worlds, not the best. The worst. <clears throat> I mean, within the Novus Ordo, within, the modernists, you are even labeled as kind of a fringe. They consider you to be a bit of a freak. Within the Novus Ordo, you are a fringe, and basically what they're saying is that at the moment, this is an ecumenical gesture on their part to allow you to consider yourself to be uh, sort of, you know, in the game with them, to, that you have a part with them. And that's exactly what it is. It's Novus Ordo ecumenism to uh, try to consider themselves somehow at least partially in communion with the, the, those who want Catholic tradition. Um, and this is, this is part of their overall ecumenical effort toward all religions. At the same time, they're, they're, they're maybe giving you a, a closet in their Nova Sordo mansion, <laughs> right, <laughs> where you can extraordinarily you know, have the 1962 Latin Mass, I mean, they're also, Francis is also going around embracing the woman archbishop of Protestant sex, literally, literally embracing her and saying he wants to be in communion with her. At the same time, saying that we're not go he's not going to have uh, women or priests in the Novus Ordo. He's embracing women archbishops in Protestant churches, saying he wants to be in communion with her. So this is the, the insanity of the contradiction uh, endemic in modernism. This is what modernism is all about. And to think that somebody has this kind of smug reassurance that, yes, I'm, I'm within the diocese, the Novus Ordo Diocese of such and such, recognized by the Novus Ordo Bishop of the Novus Ordo Diocese of such and such. And uh, no, I wouldn't go to one of his Novus Ordo Masses, but I can have the, the 1962 Latin Mass and, and I can be perfectly legitimate. <clears throat> Because he's letting me have the use of a garden shed, you know, <laughs> on, on the grounds of his mansion, and, and letting me consider myself an extraordinary form of Catholicism, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a farce. It's just a, a sad thing that people are willing to go along with a farce like that. Mm -hmm. And Father, I know that uh, Father, <coughs> Father Skierke, in one of the sermons that we recently uploaded to the channel, he talked about that exact thing, how so many people are willing to uh, just go for the external things. He said he, he's encountered individuals who, as long as they have a priest who wears a cassock and speaks mm. in Latin, then he's good. That's all they need. And mm. it's just this shallow thing with no real understanding of, of, of the real essentials, what's really happening there mm. in, in modernism. It's almost as though for some of the priest just turns around and says, Dominus Fabiscum. That's all they need. That, that would <laughs> sound their consciences. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the height of tradition. Sure. Yep. Um, but there's so much more to the Catholic faith than that, obviously.
Yep. Well, Father, here's another email about the new Mass. This is from a viewer uh, who apparently has been having some discussion with a Novus Ordo friend, and he offers some of the his Novus Ordo friend's points that he's made concerning the new Mass versus the traditional Mass. Mm-hmm. And he would like for your assistance in, uh, in rebutting some of these arguments, Father. So one of the first points that his Novus Ordo friend made was... Uh, that he has never picked up anything objectionable in any of the prayers offered at any of the masses, any of the Novus Ordo masses that he's attended. As far as the uh, abuses in the Novus Ordo, his Novus Ordo friend says that he's seen these on the internet, but not in person. And regardless, steps have been taken to eliminate them. So how would you respond to that, Father? Well, let me think. Uh, I'm wondering how he can... He must have his thumbs and his ears and his fingers over his eyes at the same time. Um, is there not hand communion given out in the churches he goes to, or does he just not consider that to be an abuse, right? Um, do they not have a table? Do they have an altar, actually? If it is a table, does he not consider that to be an abuse, okay? Because that is not uh, a table is not for sacrifice, it's for a meal, an altar for a fast sacrifice. Mm-hmm. And the Mass is essentially a sacrifice, right? Um, is the um, <clears throat> the offertory, uh, the prayers of the offertory, the Novus Ordo offertory, which doesn't even mention uh, a sacrifice offered in reparation for sin, uh, except obliquely, but the, 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 the stated fact in the, the offertory prayers of the traditional Mass that this is the sacrifice of our Lord offered for the forgiveness of sins, for all of those there at the Mass, all of the true Catholic, the faithful Catholics out the world, and even the living and the dead throughout time, that this is the sacrifice of Calvary that is being offered there? Um, is he not paying attention to what the prayers that they're actually saying that have eliminated that idea from the offertory prayers? Does, um, in other words, what I'm saying is, does he even know what he should be listening for? And what's missing missing there? Do they not have extraordinary ministers there? I mean, do do they, if he really believes that it is the body of Christ that is there, do they have anything to prevent the particles of the host from falling all over the floor where people are walking to receive the host? Does he even know what an abuse would be? He's only seen them on the Internet. (laughs) Well, um, maybe, maybe he considers abuses to be like Francis Bergoglio's, Jorge Bergoglio's puppet mass is down in, uh, at the stadiums in, in Argentina. Maybe that would be an abuse for him. I mean, what constitutes an abuse for him? <clears throat> um, the, the fellows who dress up like nuns in, Calif- in, 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 La- in California, San Francisco, get in line and put their hands out, you know, for, uh, for one of the wafers. Would he consider that to be an abuse? If that's uh, if it has to reach that level to be an abuse, then I'm, I'm sorry, but he's not thinking like a Catholic. And Father, I think this next point is very revealing along those same lines, because our traditional viewer mentioned something about the real presence of, of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament and the, mm-hmm. perhaps the, the abuses that the Novus Ordo does. And, and the uh, Novus Ordo friend responded, By the reference to real presence, I presume you are referring to the, quote, me and God atmosphere of the traditional mass. Oh, okay. Versus yeah. the communal okay. emphasis of okay. the Novus Ordo. He says, My sense is that the me and God sense of the traditional mass was fostered by the unfamiliar language, the community's non participation mm. in the mass, the total silence of the community, and the total lack okay. of any interaction with the members yeah, of the look, community. Yeah, look, the man is a modernist. Mm. Okay, I mean, th- that statement says it all. Yep. You know, so what is he even going to consider an abuse? You know? <clears throat> they might as well be talking two different languages. Oh, sure. <laughs> but that, no, no, he's wasting his time in dealing okay. with that. This the man has a different religion. He has a totally different faith. Mm-hmm. They may use some similar vocabulary, but they don't mean the same thing. Yep. And so it's, it's, you know, if he's going to talk to this man, he has to talk to them not as one would talk to a Catholic. <clears throat> Okay, because the man does not have the Catholic faith. Right. This, uh, this final point here, I think, <coughs> illustrates that even further. He says, the, uh, the Mass is definitely not a private prayer of the priest witnessed by the congregation as implied by the practices associated with a traditional Mass. 
It is the, as implied by okay. Mm -hmm. it is, he doesn't know the. Category. It is the prayer of the community led by the celebrant. Is that true, Father? Well, that's the definition okay. of the new, new mass given in the first general instruction. Mm -hmm. The general instruction uh, on the Nova Sura Misse, which came out in 1970, with the Nova, Nova Sura Missal itself, defined the uh, new mass as the gathering together of the people of God under the presidency of the priest in order to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. And the next sentence read, and therefore uh, there is realized um, in, the, in the local assembly the words of Christ that where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Period. Now that is a Protestant definition yeah. of a yeah. Protestant service. Yeah. Uh, Catholics do not regard the Mass merely as a memorial service of the death of Christ um, at all. Uh, the priest doesn't just preside, he is there in the person of Christ to speak the words of Christ at the Last Supper and to consecrate the bread and the wine, the actual living body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, who places himself on the altar sacrificially, sacramentally and sacrificially, right? As St. Paul says, showing forth his death, it manifests his death there, uh, our Lord's sacrificial death on the cross. It doesn't sound like this man believes that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, you know, I, I would just recommend to this fellow, he, he just faced the fact that his friend is Novus Ordo. He really is, which means... He, he believes, if he believes anything, he believes as a Protestant. That's the best you can say about him. Yeah. But he is a modernist, and um, it's very difficult to have a rational discussion with a modernist, let alone talk about matters of faith with a modernist. Mm -hmm. Because, again, they use the same terminology and have totally different meanings. And Father, throughout this whole, uh, all of these points that he lays out here, the, um, these Protestant ideas, um, they're, they're just, they're so palpable. Just, he, there's such an mm -hmm. emphasis on this idea of the community mm -hmm. and the, the people, the congregation being involved, the congregation saying some of the prayers. And, and, well, the and congregation is Christ. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's, so, there's so much of a focus on this, and um, there's actually an, another email which talks about the same idea, and ask if you could um, address this false sense of community that the Protestants have, and what is, what is the traditional <coughs> sense of a community in regards to the well, The community of saints. Okay. You know, the community of saints is all about that. <clears throat> That's what the real community is. Okay. It's a community of grace. It's defined by God's grace, right? And for the communion of saints, we as Catholics are in uh, communion not only with the, the faithful here on earth, but also the souls in purgatory who are in the grace of God, who have a love, true love for God. And they, they are saved, but they're not in heaven yet, okay? But they, have, they are in the state of sanctifying grace. And even the saints in heaven. I mean, by the community of saints, we're even communion with the, with the blessed angels in heaven, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and it is by grace that we are, we are in communion with them. So we can pray for each other, and we do, you know. I mean, we can benefit each other. The saints in heaven can benefit us. We can benefit the saints, the souls in purgatory, and, and for that matter, they can benefit us too. By prayers, we are united in that, in that common love, the love for God. That is the real community there. Uh, the Novus Ordo wants to substitute an earthly sense of community for a divine and heavenly and spiritual sense of community. The Novus Ordo wants to substitute a worldly sense of community for that. And uh, it, it, there is no substitute for it. Okay. You know? um, but this is the preparation for the coming of the Antichrist, because the Antichrist is going to want to, want to try to unite mankind under him. And he's got to create this world community, this globalism, okay? You, you've heard the word globalism used. I mean, it's global this and global that, right? Community this, community that. But it's all very natural. But this is the, this is the essence of modernism. It's all about this world, life in this world. Social justice is everything, right? Global warming. Mother Earth, taking care of the Earth that we live on. <clears throat> Who was it... Uh, 
It was uh, Ettore uh, Gotti Tedeschi, whom we just quoted. We just read his talk, right? I recommend that our readers, our listeners, go and read that and the commentary I made on the talk. He says th that they, through the Vatican, are trying to bring the world to a Gnostic environmentalism as the new religion for the world, for mankind. Gnostic environmentalism. Now, you know, one could talk a lot about that, and, you know, I'm quite capable of talking a lot about, you know, drop of a hat anyway. So I don't want to get off, you know, uh, too much. But just so people understand what this means, Gnostic, Gnosticism is the belief that mankind is God. I mean, that we, as a community, you know, that we, we are God. Gnosticism believed that the, the, the good God was imprisoned in this world, and it is basically the souls of mankind who are the pieces of this good God, who have been fragmented in the world and imprisoned in the world, as it were. Gnosticism's fundamental idea is, though, that as good Gnostics, that is with the gnosis, the knowledge, the knowledge that we are God, that frees us. It frees us from the slavery to commandments. <clears throat> of an evil God who wants to bind us under commandments, you know. And, and it frees us to, to follow our own lights and, and uh, do our own thing and so on. And it, it frees us from the restrictions, you know, of, of, uh, <clears throat> of the very narrow confines of morality that would pre pre prevent abortion or, <clears throat> or that would prevent uh, homosexual marriages. And these are all <clears throat> limitations that have been imposed upon us. And we have to recognize our own divinity as a race. We are God. We are the consciousness of God in the world. The New Age movement, all that stuff. And I mean, it all goes together. The Age of Aquarius, Teilhard de Chardin, all that stuff, right? <clears throat> all about the idea that our consciousness, raising our consciousness, we are God. We are the consciousness of God in the world, globally, as a race. <clears throat> we have to leave behind the old dogmas because we have the only, the new dogma of Gnosticism that we recognize our own divinity. That's the one dogma we have left. And environmentalism means that we dedicate ourselves to the care of the world, right, as our home. If you look at the in, encyclicals of all the Novus Ordo Pontiffs, they're all about this world. They do not talk about saving your soul, going to heaven, uh, you know, sanctifying the soul by grace. You don't talk about that. I mean, it's all about this world because they're modernists and that's all they think of. This world is all there is as far as, as, far as they're concerned in the practical order. And um, our taking care of it is, is the true religion. Gnostic environmentalism. <laughs> <clears throat> so, um, you know, when you talk about a sense of community and so on and that that, uh, that, that, that obsession with community, he's talking about uh, world, the worldly communitarianism that is the work of the modernist uh, Gnostics of our own day, starting with uh, Francis, <clears throat> okay? Um, and um, that, is, that is the voice, and it is through, as Ettore Gotti Tedeschi said, the Vatican Academy of Sciences, the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, that he's bringing in all these prophets of this environmental Gnosticism now to preach this, this, this false gospel to the world. Sounds like fun. And this gentleman sounds like he's, he's got, uh, he's been bitten by this. <laughs> he's, he's got that venom. Definitely. That is um, destroying whatever Catholicism he might have had at one point, perhaps, and filled them with these Gnostic ideas. Mm -hmm. Well, Father, that was all I had for tonight. In closing, do you have any, uh, any update for us concerning the Society of St. Pius X, a new superior general? Any, any happenings? Well, uh, Tom, we did a program recently on that. I think it's called uh, like Catholic Commentary on the News, July 18 for 2018. Mm -hmm. And I wish more people would, would watch that and spread that around because it explains what's been happening in the Society of St. Pius X. I mean, those of us who have been observing the Society of St. Pius X for the last so many years have seen a real dramatic change. We remember the time when Archbishop Lefebvre would speak, <clears throat> and he would speak like a prophet, he had the, like the voice of a prophet, talking about the, the Novus Ordo and, and how we, we are not in, 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 um, 
in communion with, with modernist Rome, he says, but we are in communion with eternal Rome, with Catholic Rome, you know. And he would uh, use very, very bold language in condemning the errors of the modernists and the corruptions of the faith going on and the damage to the souls. And, and at the same time, he was extolling and representing the true Catholic faith in beautiful, in beautiful terms, powerful terms. And we've seen the Society of St. Pius X seemingly over the last five, six years <clears throat> or thereabouts kind of drop all of that, um, uh, that, that, that prophetic voice of Archbishop Lefebvre, almost reject it and suppress it, you know. And now we know why, because they've actually, um, uh, the, the, the public relations, they've hired public relations firms to, to represent them, to craft a new public image for the Society of St. Pius X. We know this is true now. We have testimony in that program that I mentioned to you that we did recently, um, explains that. The, the sermon of the Pius X priest who was first marginalized and then basically put in, in cold storage, you know, before he left them. Uh, he's made it very clear uh, what has is, what is actually happened to the Society of St. Pius X, that they've been compromised. And it is, it is so horrible to think of the, the, what they call the SSPX becoming the brand X of of, you know, traditional Catholicism. Yeah. You know, I mean, who wants brand X? Uh, <laughs> but this is what they've done to it. This is what they've done to Archbishop Lefebvre's life's work. You know? <clears throat> and it's so tragic to see that. Um, of course, we saw that, you know, we saw that happening, the, the, the inklings of that earlier. <clears throat> and that's ultimately the reason why we were shown the door way back in 1983, because we saw there were certain inklings of this. Inklings that Archbishop Lefebvre had openings, but then Archbishop Lefebvre himself rejected that. But now, through Bishop Fillet and his long tenure, and now, I don't know about uh, Father Pagliarani, if he's going to pursue this, we have every indication that he is. You know, at first we thought Bishop Fillet was not renewed as the superior general, but another, you know, Father Pagliarani was, was, was elected, and then immediately they created two new posts of authority which didn't exist before, and they gave them to Father uh, to Bishop Fillet and Father Schmidtberger, I understand, <clears throat> so that they can continue their um, negotiations with the modernists in Rome. Wow. Negotiations for the betrayal of the Society of St. Pius X, Archbishop Lefebvre, and the traditional Catholics in their care. Well, what a tragedy that is. We have to pray for them, <clears throat> that they not... Um, they not tie the knot, so to speak, <laughs> with the modernists, because that will be a that that'll be a terrible tragedy. I, I feel badly for all those good people. There are many, many good people and many good priests in the Society of Saint Pius X who really do have the spirit of Archbishop to have, <clears throat> and um, I think who are um, very, very troubled by what they see happening, and they should be. Uh, and I I recommend to them that they make uh, you know very clear statement that this is heading in the wrong direction. We haven't come all this way for the sake now of, as it were, coming around first circle, going out the Novus Ordo front door only for the sake of circling around and coming in the back door. <clears throat> this is not what Archbishop Lefebvre intended. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know, people might, might think it's uh, being sarcastic to say going from being the SSPX to being brand X, but uh, I mean, uh, I th I'm afraid they're, they're selling out the faith. Uh, so <laughs> it's going to take a stroke of grace to make them realize yeah. that, that uh, they're definitely on the wrong track here. Sounds good. And I think the, the, those in the Society of St. Pius X who realize that have to um, need the fortitude to make it very clear that that's how they see it and they're not going to go that way with them. Sure. So let's hope. Yep. Pray. Well, Father, thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate your time. 
Absolutely, Tom. Thank you, too. Yep. No uh, any words of wisdom for Charlotte? Lately? <laughs> <laughs> Not off the top of my head. Oh, no, no, really? No, okay. No, no. Uh, She's too busy being a good girl. Oh, well, that's, uh, there's wisdom in that. <laughs> yep. Uh, so, okay. yeah, give her my best regards. I'll do that. that. Thank you, Father. You. This, this is your daughter, right? yes. your older, your older <laughs> daughter. <laughs> yep, yep. Not your wife. <laughs> no, Father. <laughs> but, uh, no, Tom does tell me some of the uh, words very of innocent uh, Profound things that Charlotte has to say on <laughs> theological matters, and uh, I'll tell you, she she uh, is close to having her doctorate in, in sacred theology. <laughs> I must say, as children will, yeah, just from the questions they ask, let alone the answers they give. So. Oh boy! So, right. so now I know where she gets it from, Tom. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Father. Appreciate Appreciate it. Time. Yep. Good night. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics <laughs> Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.